Hello, dear sisters. Here we are again at my home. And today I want to present something very important before you, something that has been brewing on my heart for this past week. And my message today is going to be a message of encouragement, because that's what I feel I should do <laughs> for you, is to keep building you up in your calling um, to pray for your husband and to be an intercessor for your husband. So the name of my message today is Earnesty and Importunity in Praying for Our Husbands. And you know, I don't know if you've noticed that, but from my own personal experience and the experience of seeing other people, I noticed that sometimes when we pray, uh, we kind of give up praying uh, for different reasons before we even get to the point of breakthrough in prayer, which is an answer or some things shifting in our life in a direction of good or a breakthrough. We just give up and uh, then do not even get to that point of breakthrough. And many things prevent us from getting to that point of breakthrough, which can be discouragement, we just don't see the answers, maybe praying for our unbelieving husband, probably like many of you for years and years, and you don't see any change, or lack of faith, we just lose faith, or uh, not really diligent enough to come to the Lord to ask for the gift of faith, which is a gift, obviously. So we lose faith, so we don't persevere in our prayer, or sometimes we lean on our understanding. Once again, if I don't see answers, why should I keep praying? Or everything is so bad, nothing is going to change. And I just keep going, go on and go on and go on. Basically, it's all rationalizing. It's all leaning on our understanding. That's what prevents us to keep praying and being diligent in our prayers. And this all is a sign of walking by sight and not by faith. But in this little message that I'm presenting before you, I'm going to present some truths before you that will help you, my dear sister, and me, I'm preaching to the choir, to persevere in and be importunate in our prayers. And for some of you, maybe you're not familiar with the word importunity or importunate, which is obviously used in a King James Bible translation, which I really love. And one of the Bibles that uh, I think maybe I mentioned before that I really recommend that you use for your Bible studies is the Hebrew, the Hebrew Greek key study Bible, where you can look up the meanings of the biblical text in Hebrew and in Greek, which is always fun and gives you deep understanding of the word. But basically, what does importunate mean? Importunate means always demanding things. Or um, uh, to importune, which is a verb, obviously, may, means to make repeated requests, often in an ongoing or troubling way. So, and that's what I'm going to do for you today. I'm going to teach you and pump you up and encourage you how you can go on in prayer and wait and get that breakthrough in prayer before you just throw your hands in the air and say, okay, I'm done. Although we just started. Uh, maybe, of course, maybe some of you obviously have been praying for years. So, um, in Luke chapter 11, verses from 1 to 13, Jesus teaches his disciples this same lesson where he illustrates the earnesty and importunity in prayer. And let us read the text. For the sake of time, which I strongly recommend you read the whole chapter, it's always, always as an incredible rule for studying the Word of God is reading uh, things in context, never just reaping them out. But for the sake of time, I will start with the key verse of this chapter, which is verse 5, and I will finish in verse 13, which is a lot of reading, but it's worth it. It's completely, completely worth it. So let us take uh, time to read this text. And he said unto them, which is Jesus obviously speaking, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine is in his journey, is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though 
he will not rise and give him because, because he's his friend, yet, that's our key, <laughs> because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given, our se given to you. That's our second key verse. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And those, all those promises are for you, my dear sister. But there is a condition because of his importunity. And I will elaborate on this later. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a fish? Uh, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If he then, being evil, know how to good give gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So, this proverb obviously illustrates incredibly, and that's Jesus illustrating it for you and for me. It's not just there for, just for us to read as a beautiful story. No, there is a point to it. There is a deep meaning to it. It illustrates the importunity in prayer, earnestly in, earnestly in prayer. And it shows that we, you and I, can actually move the heart of God, stir it up with compassion towards us as we continue knocking, as we continue asking, as we continue seeking. Um, so, also, we see in verse 8, which is an incredible encouragement for you and me, my dear sister, that those prayers, those importunate prayers, will bring abundant fruit. In verse 8, we, we read that uh, the Lord, obviously, will give us as much as we need, as much bread as we need, as, as in the parable, obviously. So, let us continue praying until we get a breakthrough. Let us continue knocking. Let us not give up before the door is opened and those breads are presented before us. God wants us to satisfy those prayers through us and give us the joy and privilege of being intercessors. What an incredible calling. Why would he choose me? I'm just nothing, dust. <laughs> I, I actually worse than dust, probably. I don't know what can be more meaningless than just dust. You know, but he chose us to pray for our husbands, to pray for our families till there is a breakthrough. Let us keep encouraging each other. Asking in prayer, uh, in prayer means coming to the Lord as a beggar. We don't have anything to present before him. What can I give him back? I'm just a beggar with an empty, you know, little basket before him of my heart so he can feel it. As a beggar coming to a generous person, we are completely, you and I, on the same, if you're a born-again Christian, born-again woman in the Lord, we're in the, in the same, we just, we're just completely at his mercy, on the same level. There's no partiality with the Lord. You know, we are just all completely, completely at his mercy, only because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Because of his blood, we have the access boldly, we can boldly access the throne of grace in time of need. So, um, and we know, just as we read in uh, verse 13, that if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So the Lord gives us good gifts, and the ultimate gift, obviously, is the infilling of the Holy Spirit at any moment when we come to him, which we need. We need to have the mind of the Spirit so we can pray in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit. So the Lord gives us good gifts because only he knows what is eternally good for us. Uh, everything is about eternity. We are being created, molded, shaped 
by dying to ourselves into the image of Christ da uh, daily. So it's all about eternity, our place in eternity. And sometimes the Lord gives us or answers to us in a way that doesn't really look good to us uh, because we already have a preconceived idea on how we think the prayer should be answered. And unfortunately, I wish I, I could say that I don't do that, but I do. You know, I pray for God's will to be done, and then finally when it's done, I'm not happy. <laughs> and I'm sure you can relate, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but our understanding of what is good is set in time. We have a time-boxed vision, so to say. We do not see just as the Lord obviously sees omniscient, omnipotent God that sees what is going to be good for us in eternity. We only see right now. We only see today. We don't even see tomorrow, actually. But we think that it's going to be good for me for today. But what about eternity? Only the Lord knows. So we need to ask for the fresh and feeling of the Holy Spirit, just as the Lord liberally offers in us, in, to, for us in verse 13, so we can have the mind of the Lord pray in the Spirit, pray His will, and always pray, my dear sister. And that's what I'm again preaching to myself, that for the Lord's will to be done. In any prayer, no matter what you ask for your husband, what your petition for your family is, for yourself, always, always say, Lord, only if this is your will. Um, and um, the Holy Spirit will reveal, obviously, to you his will. And we also know that the Lord chooses to execute his plan in the light of his plan for all humanity. We're just little specks, you know, little specks of dust, cosmic dust upon this earth. You know, but so sometimes we think, I've been praying for my husband for years and years and years. Why nothing is happening? Why is there is no breakthrough in our relationship or in, in, in his work or in his care? Character, whatever your things are that you're bringing before the Lord, you know, because the Lord is not working according to our timetable. He's working according to the eternal timetable of eternity. Actually, he works not even outside of time because time does not exist for him. He, he is the Alpha and the Omega, uh, you know, the beginning and the end existing outside of time. Um, he relates to us in time, obviously, but he himself exists outside of time. So every answer that you will receive from the Lord, it will always be um, from the Lord with the idea for you to grow closer in the relationship with him and also the answer that you will cause you to completely surrender all your rights, all your agendas, all your preconceived ideas, what you think is good, you know, with, with our pee little brains, with, as if we know what's good for me, you know, just like I was talking about my previous study, as if we know how we need to be loved, you know, in what way. No, we just, our understanding is limited. So, that's what the answers from the Lord will be for us to completely surrender before him. And, you know, I wanted to mention something interesting. Um, lately, I've been working out every day. And the more I work out, the more obviously my muscle works. I kind of probably should show it off a little bit. No. <laughs> but basically, the more my muscle grows and grows and grows and becomes stronger and stronger. But for the, reason, for the way for my muscle to grow, I need to exercise it regularly, not just once a month. Obviously, there will be no results. And I need to feed it, which I feed it with oxygen when I breathe right, when I exercise and I you know, pump my arms or whatever I do. And also with water, you know, so it can you know, lubricate my muscles and bring the oxygen to my muscles. And the same applies to prayer 100%. It needs to be exercised. <laughs> it needs to be fed. And, you know, the, my last conclu conclusive thoughts um, is how do we feed 
obviously we know how to exercise a muscle of prayer by praying <laughs> and that's what I hoping, I'm hoping you're doing. But how do we feed the muscle of prayer so it can grow? By biblical truths. And obviously the best food, you know, the cream of the crop for our muscle of prayer is faith. Faith and the Word of God builds faith in me and it builds faith in you. So let me present a couple of truths on prayer to feed your muscle of prayer. Those truths are, for example, truth number one, that we will be rewarded openly for our prayers. And that's Matthew 6, verses from 5 to 15. And please read and study and pump yourself and feed your muscle of prayer with these verses. Write them down, Matthew 6, 5 from to 15. Then we can also have assurance of the breakthrough and answers in our prayers. They are on the way. We can have that assurance. Matthew 7, verses from 7 to 11. We also can be assured of the possibility of impossible, from the you know, point of view of sight, moves of God and miraculous answers if we have faith, which we can obviously ask for the Lord to increase our faith. Um, and uh, we, that point is supported by Mark 11, verses from 20 to 26, and all of this above principles that I just mentioned, they work under the condition of the lesson in prayer that Jesus presents before us in Luke 18 on the importunate widow. And obviously we're all familiar with this scripture, with this passage, but please read it again and think about it. Who, by the continual, which in Greek means far more exceeding, far more exceeding. And again, I looked it up in my Bible that is so convenient. By her continual coming, crying day and night, in verse 7, was avenged. She received the answer. And let me conclude by this. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Luke 18, 8. And Lord wills, I'll see you next week. And keep praying.